Welcome in to the Husker 24-7 podcast. I'm Mike Shaver, joined by Brian Christopherson, Michael Brunts, the Husker 24-7 trio. Those two are back from Colorado, and I'm sure they can't wait to dive into a conversation about Nebraska football and everything that we have seen over the first two weeks. And so let's just dive right into it. Uh, gentlemen, before we get into Matt Rule's comments from Monday, uh, let's get your thoughts, what you saw out in Colorado uh, as Nebraska lost 36-14 to the Buffaloes. Brunts. Uh, yeah, I mean, where to start? Um, you know, you had the what the, the supposed pregame uh, disrespect um, from Matt Rule that, you know, whatever. Um and beyond that, I mean, I it was what probably three quarter, three and a half quarters of really good defensive football, and then about four quarters of really bad um, offensive football. So, you know, it's it's tough to it's tough to win games on the road when you're turning over the ball as much as Nebraska is now, and now you're you're back in Lincoln and trying to figure out what the heck you can do to uh, get get the boat anchor off the back of the defense there. Yep. BC, your thoughts? The old Denny Green quote where he had the, the thing after the Bears got his team where he's like, we're off the hook. I felt like um, Nebraska just that, – that was sort of the line that was in my head as I watched that game play out. Not that Nebraska necessarily would have won the game, but they let Colorado off the hook from having to strain for four quarters and win that game as it should have been. It should have been – in my mind, a one-score game either way. I felt that the two teams, I actually still think this, are comparable in a lot of ways, but not a QB. And that's a pretty big deal when you're, you know, if you're going to hand away, um, as I've said, like a 10-point gift card right there when it's zero to zero, or stretch two minutes, and then you're running uphill with the boulder on your back. Um, that, that's no way to live. And and it was, it was disappointing because... I did feel like Nebraska's defense was really ready to like go toe to toe with that that group and and make that a kind of compelling afternoon of back and forth with 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 uh, Lewis and his offense and because of the turnovers it, we weren't able to see that. Brunts, uh, what what individual performances defensively stood out for you? Let's start with the good because we're going to spend a lot of times on Jeff Sims and I don't need to start that right now. Two minutes into the podcast. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I, I think what you're seeing is a, an impressive coaching job by Tony White, because on the one hand, you have veteran guys that are playing good football. And, and let's be honest, you know, better football than I think they've probably played at, at points during their Husker careers. I mean, even Nick Henrich coming off of a, an injury um, and, and, you know, the, the the kind of nagging injury this year, the knee injury last year, I thought, you know, him going forward as a blitzing linebacker looked pretty good on, on Saturday. Um, you know, I, I think that linebacker group as a whole, I mean, you know, Makai Bayer, who, you know, was probably on some people's lists of guys that, you know, might hop in the portal because they were going to be so buried on the depth chart, played more than 40 snaps and looked really good in that game. Um you know, Cam Linhart continues to look like uh, an, an absolute steal uh, for Nebraska. Uh, you got Riley Van Poppel in there getting a sack. Um, you know, that, that's just kind of up and down the board, I think, across that defense. Guys are playing at a really high level. And the the fact that you have – they've struck a really nice balance between trying to win with the veteran guys that they have and getting more out of those guys and also getting a bunch of young guys – you know, ready to play and contributing right away. I think that speaks to not only, you know, the, the defensive depth that they have, but I think the coaching job that Tony White and, and this staff has done, and it's it's not an easy one either. I mean, you think about this. I mean, Tony White's the one guy that's kind of outside of the Matt Rule constellation. A lot of these assistant coaches that are familiar with Matt Rule are having to learn the three three five for the first time in the spring. And they've done a really nice job of developing guys and, and you know, kind of incorporating guys that I wouldn't even have factored into this defense. So it, it's, there's a lot, a lot of good there. And, and that defense has played well enough to win both games. I think. BC, were we expecting Nebraska to be this deep defensively? I mean, when we were talking about Makai Bear as one of the, 
the kind of the bright spots in this Colorado game. I mean, we're talking about a guy that is further down on the depth chart. You're you're probably talking about defensively. It feels like they have, I don't know, eighteen to twenty five different guys showing up these these last two weeks. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't prepared for Nebraska to be this deep defensively, and yet it it feels like they can just kind of slide in and slide out different guys, and they're comfortable in this system to go out there and make plays. Now it's just two games; they got to get through the other ten. The defense is clearly going to have to carry a lot of the load here. Um, but are you were were you expecting it to be kind of this deep at, at every level? As much as they talked about, hey, we're going to play 18 to 25 guys during the offseason, that's one of those things, especially around here, you're still like, I'll believe it when I see it. And you're also wondering, okay, that sounds fine, but what if it's just a drop off a cliff from guys like 15 to 22 or whatever, you know? So the thing that's impressed me is they haven't had that noticeable dip when they go bring, you know, second or third team guys in there. And I think the thing that probably keeps guys um, kind of bouncing around is, yes, they're having success, but like a guy like Bayer is a good example that Bruns brought up. The fact that he's um, gone from guy who might be on too deep in camp to 40-plus snaps a game shows that the staff, especially on that defensive side, is willing to, to play those guys if you're earning it um, d- during the practice session. So um, – I've been really impressed with that group. I know that they, uh, I think they, the disappointment of the day and how that game was sort of going to go in the fourth quarter kind of settled, settled in on them and they, it got away from them. But um, seven quarters to, of the eight to me have been pretty good and um, probably better than I expected, to be honest, on that side of the ball. So if we're going to have conversations about the good, it, it, right now that's the thing. It's all centered on one side of the ball. And there's a lot of good, but then get to the other side and um, you're kind of searching a bit. Brunt, uh, if there is a criticism for this defense, they haven't forced turnovers. I mean, they have one takeaway in eight quarters. And the thing is, it's not like there's really been a lot of opportunity. I guess Javen Wright could have snagged one of those two passes on Saturday. But if I have one sort of concern as it moves forward. If you're going to play through your defense, don't you feel like they they need to be even more disruptive in terms of takeaway before we can really think this is a thing Nebraska can rely on week in and week out? Because the the sacks were great against Colorado, but it didn't matter when you allowed over 50% on third down in terms of conversion. So I, I guess if there's one thing that still worries me for this defense, it's that the Havoc plays that they do have have been nice but it hasn't resulted in points going the other way. Yeah, the they, they've got two. They had the one at Omar Brown's. Um, oh, the fumble at the very end of the game yeah. on Saturday, right? Yeah. yeah. I forgot about uh, that one. Yeah, I mentally have point, not counted it. <laughs> your, your point is correct, though. I mean, I, I think that's that's kind of the next step for the defense is how do you, you know, you, you're, you're great between the 20s. Um, they, they have given up, you know, points in the red zone, but you know, half their points have been points that have come off of turnovers. So take that for what's worth. Um, but yeah, I mean, how, how do you, you know, get off the field? How do you change momentum um, with a turnover? I mean, that's, that's the next step for this defense. And they, I don't know, I felt like they had opportunities against Minnesota that maybe they weren't able to convert. I mean, the, the Gifford play late in that game um, kind of being the one that stands out the most, but you know, I, I think, uh, you know, the third down piece of it's big. I, I think also just how do you, how do you start to, you know, what, if you sack a guy, you know, get, get the fumble. I mean, th- those types of things. I mean, I, I think those things will come. I mean, I think some of those are, you know, coin flip type plays, but um, that, that, that would be, I think what would kind of take this defense to the next step. Cause right now, I mean, they're a top 10 run defense in the country. Um, you know, they're, they're really making teams, uh, work for things. Obviously, the sack numbers are pretty good. So, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you can, you know, do what you can to tidy up that turnover differential, and my God, there's a lot of work to do there. Um, that that would be that would be the next step for the defense. I, I completely agree. And, and Matt Rule talked about that after the game too. That that was, you know, it, 
when, when you were playing on the road like that, I mean, think back to that Omar Brown interception. That that was such a big moment uh, in that game uh, to kind of, you know, give Nebraska some juice. So we'll see if they can do it over the next couple of weeks against uh, Northern Illinois, who has shown that they're turnover prone uh, and then whatever Louisiana Tech's going to bring in here. Yeah. Uh, BC special teams was anything but special against Colorado. What is there a cause for concern or is this just part of the college football yo-yo where one week it looked fantastic and the next week you have Brian Buscini hitting a 26 yard punt when you need to flip the field? <clears throat> well, it's something to watch. I mean, you hope, you know, you hope it was just an off day for Buscini. Also, you hope there's not, like, an injury attached to that. I know he, in the first game he got, uh, you know, ran into a couple times um, by Minnesota and up against Colorado. Um, so I don't know if that was any part of it. Uh, Rule didn't really say after the game when asked about him. Um, but, yeah, it was it was uh, surprising to me because I thought, especially in the altitude, he was going to go out and, and probably hang a few 50, 55 yarders. And in warmups, he was hitting some like those. So he was certainly, uh, his leg was capable of it that day. But um, Alvano, I don't know, it was one kick and he, he hits the upright. You hope, uh, you hope he gets that next one, though. There's going to be that 40 yarder and it might come Saturday night. And that would be a big confidence booster because I know he hit his first college kick and that was nice, but it was more of a chip shot. Um, you know, you're going to have some misses at that position, but you, you think the overall operation is fine on special teams. Like I, I like what they're all about, but you've got to have those headline guys be who they're supposed to be. Otherwise the whole thing is described as being a flunking grade at the end and is accurate, you know? So um, it, it really comes down to the legs of two guys. If, if you can kind of pull them out of what we saw on Saturday. Yeah, um, I uh, Brunt. I'm curious. Do you do you look at this as as Nebraska simply just needs to go out and and play more better football in terms of making plays, or like where does if you're trying to size this up, where do the fixes come as they're in this third week and their first home game and their first real bye game opportunity uh, to to kind of fix stuff? I mean, they're they're sort of in the, the point of the season where you're you're hoping to kind of move the momentum forward. And for Nebraska, it's you're still kind of trying to correct a lot of the mistakes. Yeah. I mean, are you talking because I, I mean, it's a different conversation, right? Like if it's if you're talking offense, I mean, we, we can probably just run the rest of the podcast on the offense. I mean, I. You know, if anybody me, wants that, please let us yeah, know let me, in this closed we, environment that we're in. We, we got to talk about it. This is a safe space. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, I think I think you hit on it defensively. I mean, I, I, or we hit on it defensively. I, I think it's it's just a matter of you know how do you kind of take it to the next level because I think they're already playing at a, a pretty high level. Um, special teams wise, you know, I, I, maybe it's a one off. Um, you know, Bush, it, it was the the Bushini thing was weird because I was watching him in warm ups, just absolutely boom punts, uh, and then there was you know three in a row that just didn't look right at all. Um, in that game and obviously gave Colorado a pretty good field position, but offensively there, there's a lot to unpack. I mean, I, there's not a lot right now on the offense that's going well. There's some things that are, you know, kind of neutral. I mean, I think, I think the running back game is, I would consider neutral. I think the offensive line is probably neutral at best tight end play, probably neutral, but it, it, neutral is not going to win you games. Um, it, neutral at best is not going to win you games, especially when the, the problem is, is that you, you're you going into this season talking about how you want to play uh, close games. You, you want to have, you want to win the turnover battle. You want to win games in the fourth quarter. And in order to do that, you have to play efficient offensive football and complementary football. And thus far, Nebraska has what, maybe like two quarters that they've done it in Minnesota. Yeah, I guess. I mean, <laughs> in so much as that third quarter, they, I guess you got the good kick return, your one touchdown and uh, either a take. Yeah. A, a takeaway. So, I mean, that's very, yeah, very one, generous two quarters, one, one quarter for sure. I'll give you that second okay. quarter. We'll just assume exists, but I can't, yeah. 
I can't tell you which of the other, you know, you, you could seven. You could glom everything together, right? Like a little bit here, a little bit there, into like one one additional quarter. So, no, I mean that that's that's the challenge this week is how do you figure out the offense while also doing so with questions about Jeff Sims's health. And I mean, let, let's you know get into Jeff Sims. We may as well, right? Can I, mean, can I ask one thing before we get into Jeff Sims? You may. What what level of concern should fans have about Nebraska's ability at wide receiver and at tight end? I mean, and this this stems from the fact that you have a leading receiver with 57 yards through two games. Uh, they were able to get Billy Kemp the ball more in this Colorado game, so that I think should should help with some of the fear there. But frankly, you had two different instances on Saturday where plays just need to be made. Alex right. Bullock has to make that catch. Right. You're you're not on the field for any other reason than to make that catch. And it's the same for Thomas Fedoni on his drop in the first half, too. Like, and part of it is if you play in the thin razor margin that Nebraska's offense seems to be in, when you have your opportunities, yeah. you have to make those plays. And I just I don't know that they have enough guys that can make plays on offense. I just don't, even in the running game. Gabe is good at getting you what he can. He's not going to run away from anybody. They don't have any explosion when he's on the field running the football. Or at least it hasn't looked like it against Minnesota and Colorado. Maybe it can against Northern Illinois. But there's a giant difference between watching Jeff Sims run to daylight and Gabe Irvin on his 20-yard run where there's nobody around and multiple guys catching up. Yeah. No, it's that's a fair thing. I mean, that's the challenge with the offense right now is how do you – like you can't pull playmakers out of the air, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, if any program has tried for about 10 years now, it's the one that you and I have covered. So yeah, I I that's a fair assessment. But the the wide receiver piece of it, the the in a not inability, but the difficulty in winning one on ones has been something that's been a real thing all season. Like it, you know, off season too. I mean that 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 was the that's where somebody like Xavier Betts leaving hurts you a little bit because he was a guy, you know, when he was bought in that would win those types of battles. Um, you know, Billy Kemp, I think in the right spots can be that guy. I think you saw flashes of that. Um, you're absolutely right that, you know, when, when you need that cat, Alex Bullock has to make that catch. I mean, it was a, it was a good throw. Um, you know, when your quarterback is obviously struggling with confidence, um, you know, dropping snaps, et cetera, you, you, you got to help them out. And, you know, the, the tight end thing's interesting to me and, and I'll, I would need to go back and watch it again. I've, I haven't done my, my usual two rewatches, but it seems like they're having to use, a, they're having to dedicate more tight ends to helping in the run game and the pass block game than, than maybe I think what they were expecting to have to do. Like, yeah. I think both Borkature and I and Fedoni can be receiving weapons, but I think kind of what Nebraska would ultimately like to do with the tight end spot is being uh, hijacked a bit by having to help um, the tackles, uh, specifically on the left side, to, uh, to 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 kind of pass block. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know what you do. Um, I don't know how much more simple you can get as an offense. Like, yeah. you know, like I. I when you're not catching the snap and you're snapping the ball off of a, an H backs backside, um, which by the way, Nebraska snapped and kicked balls off a lot of guys asses the last few years. If we're being honest, um, what, what it's true. Just, just thinking about Zach Hannon in that punt, just punted it right off his ass. Um, so, you, you got to get all this. You got to you got to start playing whack a mole a little bit with the small stuff. Bef you know, I, I just don't, but I don't know like what the go to is right now with like simplifying things for Jeff Sims because it already looks pretty damn simple to me. Yeah, and this is where it gets kind of hard with the discussion for Marcus Satterfield because it's like, okay, you have to devote some tight ends to stay in to help pass protect because your offensive lineman can't do it one on one or they can't pick up who they have in a blitz. Or, you know, your your starting left guard gets ragdolled immediately one second into the play. Um, so it's it's hard because you then you don't long you don't have those targets 
you know, out there to, to throw to. Like, it's just a – everything is just compounded by the fact they don't have a single thing that they can really hang their hat on yet. And then you throw – you get all the way into the conversation, and, and uh, we'll welcome back Brian Christopherson here in a second. Uh, you get all the way into the conversation about what happens – uh, with, with Jeff Sims and these snaps, because then that obviously is going to derail everything too. And so there, there was a part of me on Saturday where it's like the motion is clearly affecting your own team as much as it's affecting Colorado. Like, why not go under center? Why not remove some of the variables here? Like that's one of the things I never understand. If, if you see these are, are issues and you have three of them, but you continue to call the same thing and do the same thing. You're not, uh, you know, you're making life more difficult for yourself. You're not adjusting. You're not, you know, helping yourself out uh, in, in a critical situation. So I, I, I think there is a more simple route for them to go. It's to start snapping under center and then, you know, go from there. So because frankly, Starting five yards back with the play isn't helping you at all either. So yeah. it, it's just, they're a mess. Like there's, it, it's not an easy fix because there's nothing that allows it to be easy. It's not like you can just turn the, give the ball to a running back. That's going to help make your life easier. It's not like your offensive line who by the virtue of Jeff Sims has largely moved from everyone's favorite punching bag to they kind of gotten a reprieve because, you know, it's not necessarily on them that the quarterback can't catch a snap. So, but they're not helping matters either. Same with the receivers. Like it's just, you said neutral. I don't even know that there's a position group that's in neutral right now. I think they're all fighting to get to neutral. Yeah. They're like second gear trying to get this thing out of the mud. Yeah. I, I, I would put, I would put running back slightly in, in, into that. Like, it was funny. You're talking offensive line. I mean, they basically gone from the it's the arrested development thing where they went from sell to don't buy. I mean, that that's kind of where they're <laughs> they're at right now. Like, I, I think, you know, you, you do need to find like, OK, this week, what are some things that we can do to that, that you can kind of hang your hat on a and you need to be able to at least threaten teams with the potential for a deep ball yeah like you saw it i believe once they they chucked it deep it was harburg and it was not probably where it was supposed to go about 15 yards past its intended yeah. destination so that that's the problem is that nebraska right now doesn't I, I don't think that there is a lot that opposing defensive coordinators have to worry about in terms of deep ball um or, or big play that way through the pass game and then you know, you're, 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 you're putting a lot in the offensive line that, you know, it is still developing to, to, to kind of go in and, and win, win for you. So it, it's a, it's a tough spot to be right now. And I don't know, like I, the, some of the run plays they ran in the third quarter, I thought they made some good adjustments um, against Colorado. I thought they also did a little bit against, uh, against Minnesota too. I think they made some adjustments that were effective, but you know, right now it's it's just uh, it it just feels like you're you're throwing plays at the wall a little bit and hoping that something takes off, and it's just not happening right now. I'm glad you said that because that leads right to where I wanted to ask this next question. Do you feel like Nebraska's offense has any identity as to what it wants to be? Like, I, none of their play calls seem like it lines up towards. You know, they're not a power running team. They don't. They're not calling plays like a power running team. There's sometimes spread out and they sometimes have two tight ends and it's sometimes quarterback run game. And it's, you know, it just, it, it kind of feels like they're sort of trying to figure out who they are by the virtue of the plays that they're calling relative to deciding this is what we want to be. And this is how we're going to call the game. Like I, that's, if, if I have a criticism of Marcus Satterfield, it's not so much that the offense hasn't lit the scoreboard on, on fire, it said, I don't know what they're building towards because I don't know what they are. It, yeah. you know, on any given play, some of their formation is this and some of their idea is this, but then on the next play, it's something else. And being multiple is great, but when you're bad at everything, you know, it looks even worse. And so I guess part of it is they need to figure out what it is we want to accomplish every time we have the ball. Like, what, what are we ultimately trying to do 
to get down the field and go score? Is it we want to highlight Billy Kemp? Is it we want to get the balls to our playmakers? We need to identify who our playmakers are. Are we a power running team? Are we actually using a fullback or are we talking about a fullback? Like, I, I just – I don't know what the hell they are through two games on offense. And you can watch – offensively each game against Minnesota and Colorado. And if I had you try to describe what their offense is, you know, we can get into the conversation about the snaps and how that ruins things, but I don't know what they are. I don't know what they're trying to do from, from series to series uh, and even play to play. Yeah. I mean, and, and even, you know, some of the, we had assumed there would be some I formation type stuff. I, they haven't been particularly good at that either to this point. Um, they haven't run much of it either. No, and and I think part of it is when they have it, it's been a little uh, little iffy. Like yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think the identity question is a really important one um, because it, it does seem like you know you're 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 not able to do much of anything. Uh, I mean, I, I thought you know really their opening drive against Colorado was about as good as the offense has looked. I mean, you 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 got Billy Kemp involved, you got the oh. tight ends involved. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it, you kind of wonder too, you know, as an offensive coordinator and a play caller, um, you know, when you, you see, you know, snaps being dropped, you see, you know, interceptions, bad reads it, it, there, there's just not, there, there's not a cohesiveness there. I guess, you know, it, it's probably more difficult to trust, um, what, what you're calling to, um, just given kind of how things have gone. So, I mean, that, that's, it's uh th- these next two games are really important. I mean, obviously, um, you know, you you would hope that you'd be able to to roll to wins in those games, but just for Nebraska to kind of figure out what they are offensively is going to be really important. I, you know, Matt Rule yesterday even said, you know, that the offense really wasn't able to get into much of a rhythm during fall camp because they were having to. I mean, he said that they were having to cont- kind of contend with the defense that was so multiple. Um, and, and that's that's a little concerning when you basically have a month and you're not able to kind of find things. So we'll we'll see if they can do um, do some heavy lifting this week. And and also, you know, you, you've got Sims with the ankle injury. Um, you know, fans are clamoring for Harburg. It sounds like that's probably not going to be the case if Jeff Sims is healthy um, or, or at least able to go. So I it. There's a lot of question marks this week. It's it's going to be a fascinating game, I think. Yeah, let's. Uh, we're way overdue to take a timeout. Let's take a quick timeout. We'll come back. We'll dive into some of uh, Matt Rule's comments that he had on Monday uh, about a myriad of things and all of that when we return here on Husker twenty four seven. All right. Matt Rule spoke on Monday to the Nebraska media. We didn't get into the full Jeff Sims conversation in the first half of this podcast. Uh, we will start to have some of that conversation now, I'm sure. Michael Brunts, what uh, what kind of stood out when Matt Rule assessed where things are at quarterback-wise and the health of Jeff Sims heading into this Northern Illinois game? Yeah, um, as of Tuesday morning, not a lot was known about Sims's health. They didn't practice Monday. Uh, Sims was working with the, the injured guys on Sunday night when they did practice. So they were going to kind of watch him through the week, I think, uh, not a high ankle, uh, which that was kind of the fear I think in Colorado was that it was going to be one of those five to six week high ankle sprains. It's apparently not that. So I guess that's good news. Um, beyond that, you know, obviously I, you know, he, he's able to see what's going on with the offense, what's, uh, not working with the offense, which we just laid out is about everything um, and, and took accountability for that. I thought, you know, I, I didn't think that there was too much excuse making, um, you know, I think kind of parsing out what he said. I mean, if, if Jeff Sims is healthy, he's going to continue to be the quarterback. And I know that, you know, there's a segment of the fan base that has pointed out that perhaps the way that Anthony Grant was handled uh, is different than, than, you know, the accountability or non or no accountability that you're seeing for Sims. But, um, you know, my read on that is I think the gulf between uh, Sims and the guys behind him is pretty wide. Um, I think the quarterback, you probably have to be a little bit careful with how you do that um, versus other positions. I mean, for better, for worse, there's a little bit of different rules there. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, I think everybody over there understands the assignment for what they got to do this week. Um, and, and 
you know, Northern Illinois has their attention. I, as much as, you know, they looked pretty bad against Southern Illinois last week. I mean, they did go on the road and beat Boston College in overtime. Obviously, Northern Illinois has uh, come to, come into Memorial Stadium and won before. So that that's uh, that's kind of where the, the table is set for a, uh, a pretty important week, I think, just in terms of, you know, not only winning, but making sure that y- you're showing some measurable progress. What are your thoughts on sort of Matt Rule now that we're two games into his tenure? Uh, it's no longer the off season. It's no longer Nebraska putting out videos of what fall camp and practice and and all of that looks like. There's no conversations about team camaraderie and building and and all of that thing. Now it's about the football and the product that you have on the field. And Nebraska is zero and two. Um, what are what did you think of Matt Rule after, you know, these two losses when, when he's been in the media room? And then, of course, on Monday after after uh, a second straight loss and, and meeting with the media. I mean, it's I, I'm just kind of curious if things have not changed how you view him necessarily. But it is interesting to, to get a portrait of somebody when it's no longer the offseason and you can't control all the variables. When the honeymoon's over. Um, yeah, I I don't know. I thought he was pretty straightforward i mean any anybody with you know vision can see what's going on i mean like you've got a defense that's playing really well an offense that seemingly has little to no identity and is playing really poorly um you know i thought yesterday his his comment about basically you know this for better for worse this is who we are it's going to take a little bit of time i think it's 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 a hard message for for some of the fan base to accept though, when you have the defense playing the way that they are right out of the gates, which I mean, that's positive. Uh, You juxtapose the way that things are going at Colorado and which different approaches, uh, which everybody knew going in. And, you know, I I think too, um, you know, he just kind of said like, look, this is going to take time. I think if you really kind of look at what, they did offensively in the off season. There probably needed to be a little bit more work done in the transfer portal at certain spots if possible. Um, but I, I, th- I think he was, you know, he understands, you know, the frustration. I, I also think that, that some of the fan base doesn't want to, uh, you know, may, maybe accepting patience is a little bit easier in April than it is in, in September, especially given how the last, you know, five, five years played out on the football field. So, that's where they're at. Um, and you know, they, they just need to play good football. That, that, that's as simple as it gets. Okay. Um, we, we didn't really talk about Sims that much. Is there, would you like to dive into to more Jeff Sims conversation? What ails Jeff Sims? How does Nebraska fix Jeff Sims, et cetera? Yeah. I mean, if, I, if you don't want to, you can just punt on this conversation. No, too. It, we should have it. I mean, I, I think you saw in the first game at Minnesota, how, he can be a very dynamic playmaker with his legs. You saw that in that run in the third quarter. If you can get him in space, he's going to hurt teams. And, you know, Colorado, to their credit, was blitzing the hell out of Jeff Sims. They were doing a lot of run blitzes. They were forcing the issue with him to keep him, uh, you know, in the pocket. And that goes back to the conversation about Nebraska just not having enough weapons to scare opposing defensive coordinators. I mean, you need to have something else that you can go to so that teams can't just key on Sims. Um, that doesn't absolve him from, you know, the the drop snaps, the the bad reads, the, you know, the the, the, the turnovers that, have, you know, really have, have been backbreakers for this team to two games. So I, I don't know what the quick fix is. I mean, it, you know, at some point the guys, you know, played enough college football, I think it's kind of hard to – kind of coach the mistakes out of him, but that's kind of where Nebraska's at is how do you get the most out of Jeff Sims and and kind of get this offense playing more efficient football? Um, You know, what is it? Six turnovers, seven or the the minus six. That's, that's just not going to cut it with the way that Nebraska wants to play football. And and you're basically uh, looking at a long season if they can't get those things turned around. And it's too bad too, because you look at around the big 10 and what's on Nebraska's schedule there's a lot it's kind of, of coin- soft. It's there's soft. A lot, there's a lot of coin flip games. Yeah. There's a lot of teams that are not as good as we thought, at the, at, you know, two games in. Um, so, you know, there, there's opportunity there if you can get this thing figured out. But Nebraska needs to be 
you know, they need to be at three wins coming out of that buy or, or going into the buy. That that's basically where things stand. Yeah. And to to do that, you gotta win three out of your next uh what four? Yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I can't do the math, apparently. Um yeah, I mean I, I kind of gave my thoughts with with what the best thing that you could do for Sims would be, and that's to figure out what your offense is is trying to be. I, I just think um you could make things a little more simple if you actually know what it is you're trying to get out of it. But it's hard for Marcus Satterfield to do that when they have such a disjoint, they have no rhythm. I mean, and part of it, when you have all these turnovers and um, when you're starting inside your own 10 yard line, as often as Nebraska seems to, um, you know, they just haven't had like a lot of rhythm or opportunity to get into rhythm. And so it's probably hard to change some plane calls or to, to figure out what your identity is because of that. You've had so much disruption, but I think that would certainly help. I'm not opposed uh, to the idea of moving to Heinrich Harburg, but like you, whenever people bring up the accountability thing, I understand the conversation on it. But to me, a lot of it just is they feel better about their backups at running back than they do at quarterback. Um, and as you said, the decision to bench a quarterback is not one that should ever be that light. Like it is just a, it it sort of changes the outlook on on everything that you're doing. Um, you know, what's always interesting in these situations is you usually have to worry about the locker room a little bit too. Like if you choose to go to Heinrich Harburg, is that send a message that is negative to the guys on your team? Is that send a message that's positive? So you have to, you have to figure that out too. So, uh, that's going to be something that'll certainly be watched. Uh, if Jeff Sims is able to go against Northern Illinois and it doesn't go well, how quick is there a hook? Um, you know, would Jeff Sims have played the entire game against Colorado had he not gotten hurt? It seems like the answer is yes. So, I mean, it's it doesn't feel like the staff is in a big hurry to make that change. And so I would sort of caution, um, you know, fans that are, are hopeful that they're just going to see something look entirely different at that quarterback spot. I don't think that's coming. Uh, but now would be the time to, to sort of do it because, as you mentioned, that schedule, I mean, if you're able to get through these two games and you go against Michigan and you're 500, and then you get Illinois after that and you split those two games, you go into your bye week halfway through the season, you're three and three. If you can figure out how to get to three and three on the other side of that, you did what everybody wanted you to do before the season started, which was to just not have a losing year, or at least in the regular season. So the the goal is still out there and the schedule looks incredibly light relative to previous years because the, the big 10 West is bad. I mean, there's just not a good football team in that division. Uh, and fortunately for Nebraska for one last year, they get to play all of those teams. Now all those teams get to play Nebraska too. So it kind of works both ways, but uh, you know, We'll see how that goes when they get back into the conference slate of things. Anything you want to touch on, Brunts, before we close this out? No, I don't think so. You're done. I think, I'm, I think I'm done. I'm ready. I'm tired of these conversations. I, I'm moving. We're on to Northern Illinois. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, uh, you can catch everything we have at Husker247.com. Plenty of coverage on the team on what's going on there. We have analysis. We have news coverage. We have all of it. We have recruiting. We have everything that you could want at Husker 24-7, so be sure to check all of that out. If you want more things to listen to, the Husker 24-7 Hypecast is returning this week. We'll have a new special guest. We'll be talking about Nebraska, Illinois, Northern Illinois, excuse me. We'll be attempting to get you hyped for the first home game of the Matt Rule era as Nebraska is 0 and 2. And of course, the Sunday side session made its return this past week. If you would like to hear me talk with Caleb Henry more about that Colorado game, and I don't know why you would because we're on to Northern Illinois, as Brunt says. But if you'd like to look back, there's that as well in the catalog of Husker 24 7 podcast content. All right, for Michael Brunts, I'm Mike Schaefer. Brian Christofferson is somewhere falling, uh, you know, through that giant technology hole like Ozzy Smith did in the uh, Simpsons episode. He's just falling forever. That's uh, that's where Brian Christofferson is. We hope to find him and have him back on the hype cast. We'll catch you later. We're Husker 24-7.